doctora Margaret Winter fue una científica, filántropa y aventurera del Reino Unido que acumuló una inmensa fortuna gracias a sus numerosas patentes en el campo de la ingeniería química. Margaret no pudo culminar su proyecto secreto más ambicioso, generar una superfórmula capaz de brindar alimento a todo el planeta. Tiempo antes de su muerte, con el fin de proteger su proyecto, dividió los componentes de su fórmula en siete partes. Veinte años después, su nieta favorita, Ali Winter, encontró dentro de la caja fuerte de su abuela una carta. Si lees esta carta, significa que ahora debes continuar con mi misión. El mayor de todos los tesoros que podía darle a la humanidad está oculto en siete piezas de mi colección Winter. Tu misión será recuperar y reconstruir la fórmula para desarrollar el superalimento. Para lograrlo, debes unirte a los detectives de la agencia Sofos y enfrentarte a una serie de retos para recuperar todos los objetos ocultos. El Ministerio de Educación Nacional, en alianza con el British Council, presenta Be the One Challenge. Juega, comparte y fortalece tu inglés. Una herramienta para que adolescentes y jóvenes de grado sexto a once del país se diviertan y reten sus conocimientos en inglés. Diviértete con tus compañeros de clase o con tu profesor de inglés. Monitorea tu progreso en tiempo real. De la mano de tu asistente robótico TAL 300 podrás escoger el nivel de dificultad, acceder a diferentes misiones, ganar trofeos y conocer nuevas culturas. Este juego educativo fue desarrollado por el Ministerio de Educación Nacional para que tu experiencia en el aprendizaje sea divertida y en inglés sea una herramienta de generación de oportunidades para todos. Y The One Challenge. Juega, comparte y fortalece tu inglés. Disponible en App Store y Play Store. Ministerio de Educación Nacional. La educación. Good afternoon, everyone. We will start in just in a few minutes. Remember, this webinar is going to be delivered in English. Make sure your speakers or your headphones are set. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carlos Javier Amaya. I'm the head of the National Bilingualism Program 
of the Ministry of Education in Colombia. Welcome to our conference called Online Teaching Tips for English Language Teachers. This conference will be delivered in English. Make sure your headphones or speakers are set. Thanks to our friends from the British Council, Cisco, Logicalis, and WebEx events who are supporting this strategy. During the presentation, we will be collecting questions in the chat from the teachers that are connected via WebEx events, and we will share them to our speaker at the end of the event. At the Ministry of Education, we are really happy because more than 6,000 teachers registered to this webinar, and this proves the big interest of our teachers to become familiar with the new strategies to teach English in the country. This conference is part of the Ministry of Education Contacto Maestro, a platform to support teachers and head teachers. To learn more about this strategy, make sure to visit contactomaestro.colombiaprende.edu.co. Before introducing our main speaker for today, I would like to share some of the national bilingualism program strategies to support teachers and, sec and students learning English from home. Could you please go to the second slide, to the third slide, please? Thank you very much. Uh, in Aprender Digital, in contenidos.colombiaprende.edu.co, you can find our textbooks with learning activities and audio files that can be downloaded, copied, and shared with your students as well as other materials from our stakeholders. This month, for example, you will be able to find the, for free the Pearson's collection of readers that promote English language learning through the use of uh, reading comprehension strategies. One month ago, the President Ivan Duque and our Minister Maria Victoria Angulo launched the Be The One Challenge application, our first game for students to practice English. Since then, more than 120,000 students have downloaded this application in its Android version. Soon, we'll be, we will be launching the tool for teachers to support students in the use of this application and also the iOS version for the Apple devices. In June, we will start a teacher training program in the use of Be The One Challenge, our textbooks, and leadership strategies in English language lear learning with more than 1,200 teachers in partnership with the British Council. To promote intercultural practice of English as a vehicle of communication, we also designed Talkative, a conversation club's strategy that is benefiting more than 2,000 teachers, thanks to our friends of the US Embassy in Colombia, the YMCA, the Institutos Colombo Americanos, and the US Peace Corps. Finally, with the first webinar, we are introducing a group of 12 webinars about remote teaching, homeschooling, and the use of pedagogic resources to support teachers, students, and during this lockdown provoked by COVID-19. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Graham Stanley, our main speaker today. He is the British Council's Regional Director in the Unit of English for Education Systems. He holds a master's degree in educational technology and ELT from the University of Manchester in the UK. He is also a newsletter editor for the International Association of Teachers of English as a foreign language special interest group on learning technologies. He is the editor of the Remote Teaching Strategy, author of Language Learning with Technology, winner of the 2013 Duke of Edinburgh Book Award in English from the English Speaking Union, and co-author of Digital Play, Computer Games and Language Goals, publication that won the ELT Award for Innovation back in 2012. Carolina Cruz, who is also the head of English at the British Council, is uh, shadowing this presentation. Hello, Graham. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation from the Ministry of Education, and the platform is all yours. Welcome to all our teachers. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for that introduction, Carlos. Um, please let me know in the chat if you can hear me okay. I suspect you can. Yes, now, we can. Perfect. So the British Council has many years of experience in delivering remote classes to students all over the world. For example, 
in Uruguay, the British Council has been working in partnership with Plan Cell to cater for the lack of trained and English language teachers in the project managing the remote teaching of 80,000 primary school children aged 8 to 12. I'll be talking today. Um, you can read more about in this publication that you can see this at the moment, which is free to download from the British Council. There are case studies, research about the experience uh, remote teaching, which I think I know that a lot of you will find very interesting. However, today I'm not only going to be talking about remote teaching. Now, what is this? well? There are two parts. That we're doing. There's teaching which is for life and life. And line and leaning, not leaning, apologies for the title, which is the asynchronous teaching and learning, which can be done through email, it can be done through using a learning management system or social media, etc. And I'll be looking at both of these today. Now, um, is before I move on, is to find out in the chat how many of you. Uh, are actually remote teaching at the moment, or if you're new to teaching. So if you want to put in the chat, uh, if you have experience remote teaching or not, that would be very useful for me. I can hear, I can see that the there are people so can you hear me? We can hear you. There are some cuts, but yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'll monitor the chat. I'll try my best to speak. I don't know whether I can um, improve on the audio that it is, but I'll go on and you let me know if if you have problems. I'll try and speak very clear and I'll I'll speak more slower, so it should help hopefully. It is having a better sound now, Brian. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start by looking at remote teaching. So that is the live online aspect of online learning and teaching. Now, I think it's it's worth saying it's very different um, the distinction between emergency remote teaching versus planned remote teaching. A lot of teachers at the moment because of the unexpected schools closures are doing teaching which is emergency remote teaching now hodges moore lucky trust and bond have said that the well-planned online learning experience meaningfully different online in response to a crisis or disaster an emergency if you like, is the quickly adapting adaptation. Graham, we have. It seems there is a problem with the audio. Uh, maybe can you please deactivate your camera so the sound could be better? I'll, I'll turn and see if that helps. Does that sound better to you, Carlos? Yes. Thank you very much. So, um, on to the next. Now, one of the most important things about online remote teaching or in general is the idea of normalization. The objective of using technology should be to achieve 
normalization, i.e. the technology should as far as even back in three. So that's what we would be supposed to be uh, would be trying to do when we're teaching remotely. Try and make technology disappear and as far as possible to have a normal as far as possible. Now how do you do that? Now some of you I can see have already started um, remote teaching and other people haven't. For those of you who haven't yet started, who are just starting, what advice can I give you uh, to begin with? Well, I think the first thing is to start small and to start with what you know. Don't all complicate things. Don't let yourself be overwhelmed with platforms and tools and resources. Because crisis there are now so many tips and links and articles online about what we should be doing it can seem too much however you all know how to teach start by doing what you would do more or less in the classroom but online and then adjust as you become familiar with the tools that you're using and as the students become more comfortable with them as well. Like in your face to face class, if you can establish a routine and make sure students know it, this will help. The sooner everyone becomes familiar with the online platform and the situation, the better. Make sure students know what is expected of them and what is going to happen during the class. And as soon as possible, also familiarize yourself with the platform. Know how to deal with security and know how to mute and unmute uh, students, how to give and deny access to tools and the room on the platform, etc. And this will help. What else? So once you've started, I think it's important to get feedback from the learners. Find out what worked in your class, what didn't work, what did they find useful or interesting, and involve them in the experience and pay attention to them. You'll become a better online teacher and the students will learn more. With you. Don't feel you have to stick to something if it's not working. Be prepared to radically change if necessary. And then once you are comfortable, try some new things, experiment, use the unique online aspect to do things you wouldn't usually do or couldn't do in the classroom. For example, use online backgrounds or something different, basically. And then I think it's also important that you use this as an opportunity to experiment. Don't give remote teaching a negative spin. It's temporary, probably. So create a good positive atmosphere for learning. Make the most of what you're doing. And then I would also recommend you build in some learner training into the experience. Little by little, they will learn to use the tools available, and this will help them in the long run as well. It also helps if the teacher you're enjoying yourself. So Try and remove distractions or any potential problems. And above all, have fun and make sure the students are having fun too. That way they will learn a lot more. A word of, before we move on to some more further tips of engaging students, I think it's worthwhile considering child protection. Now, child protection um, is something that the British Council holds as being very important. Um, I think it's particularly important when teaching students who are based at home, because there may be an, a parent or a guardian in the room during the class. You'll have probably more contact with parents. Now, if you can, what I would do is ask your school to help you with the parents to manage expectations. 
teachers quite sensible. They shouldn't feel like you, the teacher, should be there all the time. Some things students can be asked to do on the which I will come on to, um, more so than when it's school. And also, it's important to remember to have breaks. On the screen, you can also see some of the advice that I give you about staying safe. Um, one of the important thing is related to the links to your classes public, to managing the experience with the students, and then also making sure that you have your online classes password protected. Some general technology tips next. What I would do to begin with is hold a short rehearsal session, 20 minutes, etc. But the main purpose is to check the students or hear you, um, something that you've had problems with me today, despite our rehearsal. And they can all speak to the technology. This could be, if you don't want to hold a rehearsal, the first part of your first remote class. If individuals have problems, then you can contact them to work through the problems and sort it out, rather than disrupt the class for everyone. One thing I would recommend you do is mute everybody on entry and encourage students uh, to mute when they're not speaking. This prevents feedback and background noise. Of course, of a remote session, you should be able to mute everybody and give access to the microphone when it's needed. I would also plan a warmer or other parts of the lesson to gradually introduce features of the online platform that you want students to use. The tools for the whiteboard, screen sharing, etc. I would also, if you can, use cameras as much as possible. If your connectivity does not allow students to use webcams or lessons because the sound is breaking up, for example, as we have today, then I think it's important to at least try and start and finish with the cameras and then turn them on. Or you can ask the students to turn on the webcam when they are and everybody else can turn theirs off. If this works. I think it's also important to have a back channel open with students in case connectivity fails. A back channel is having another way of contacting them apart from the um, the platform that you're using to deliver the class. If you're able to do that, then you can contact them um, and tell them um, how you'll be able to communicate, etc. Now, this is probably the best platform to do this back channel in is to use the learning management system platform that you use with them anyway. And I'll come on to what you could do. One of the online classroom tools, for example, that we, the one that we're using today is WebEx, which is a very good tool to be able to do live online classroom. And keep giving me feedback about how my voice sounds and I can try and adapt. Uh, so please type into the chat and I'll try and, I was shouting there, so thank you. Uh, I'll speak a little bit lower. Um, now, I expect you will already be doing asynchronous or working offline with your students. If you're not, then I think there, that is an important thing to do. And I'll speak a little bit about that in a minute. I would think about flipping the classroom. Now, how many of you know what a flipped classroom is? Put it into the chat if you know what a flipped classroom is. If you don't, put it into the chat as well. Flipping the classroom is doing things because uh, that take up that would normally take up a lot of time um, in a live classroom that you can do before or afterwards that don't require you and the students to be connected live online. For example, there could be some reading or some writing, some listening activities that you could do before or after you meet together. You don't really want to meet live online with students and get them to watch a video or listen to a recording if you can avoid it. The other thing is to have a plan B ready 
instructions that you can send students to work independently or even synchronously together in pairs or groups individually if they can't connect, can't connect with them. The lowest common denominator, for example, is usually chat. You could actually try to have something available and then give them help to chat if you can't use video or audio. The other thing I would recommend is to set rules for behavior. You want to have their expectations clear, what your expectations are at the beginning before you start classes or right when you first start, and enforce them. You shouldn't let students share the links to the classes to potential people who might disrupt. Um, and also set expectations of what you expect them to do before class and after. And for the taking more responsibilities for their own learning. In the end, this will help them a lot. I would also recommend that you call session if you can. You would need permission forms probably from parents to do this. It's difficult but worthwhile. You can use these recordings to assess students, speaking, for example and also evaluate your own teaching. You can also share the recordings with peers so you can see examples of good practice. You can use them for training sessions in the future. And then finally, you can also make the recordings available for students who cannot attend the lesson due to illness or bad connectivity, etc. So I would say, don't be afraid of recording your lessons. The recordings are worth their weight in gold. But be very honest and upfront with students and um, parents about what the recordings will be used for. Don't put them on YouTube, for example, or if you do make them available to everybody, then make them password protected. And I saw the comments about uh, speaking louder and trying very hard to speak as loud as I can. So hopefully this will help. Now, here are some more general tips to take into account when teaching remotely. Firstly, prioritize outcome. Generally, everything takes longer to do than in a face-to-face -face classroom, and you won't be able to meet the same outcome you need to prioritize. You should identify what can be given and what should be read or listened to, etc., by the students before the session to save valuable time. If using a course book or materials designed for a face-to-face -face setting, then work out what can be used without adaptation and what needs to be adapted or redesigned. Keep instruction simple and limit the tools uh, you need to use uh, and gradually increase when students are comfortable. You can then introduce the idea of separate breakout rooms, for example, or other things that may need a little bit more uh, sophisticated setup after a few sessions. I would also recommend that you don't just be a talking head, you move around stand up etc and encourage students to do so as well especially if you're meeting for a long time plan and vary interaction patterns asking for answers in the chat is a good idea if they're quick because the responses in the chat are very easy it's also a good way to see if students are paying attention or indeed if they're still at the computer which is particularly important if the cameras are switched off. You also need to think about the tools the students will need to use. Are they going to write on the whiteboard? When do you want them to do this? What about sharing their screen? Make sure you show them very clear how to do this before asking. You can avoid wasting valuable time if you do this. You can use breakout rooms, which is an ability to send students into separate 
virtual rooms, then you need to uh, post instructions about what they're supposed to do in the chat, for example, or give them it by email beforehand, and then go quickly as a teacher from one room to another to monitor them and to make sure that they're on task. I would also use think about using Realia. If you can use the camera for showing more than just your head, that is great. Um, now you could show other things. You could join via another computer or your tablet or telephone if you have one um, and show things um, using that so you don't switch off your camera showing your face as well. And then if you do use a tool such as Zoom or Teams that has uh, virtual backgrounds, then you can use that and incorporate into your teaching as well. Right, I'm now going to talk a little bit about engaging students. Before I do so, what I would like you to do in the chat is to guess the missing letters in these words. So what about the first one, which says E something contact and S something present? What are the two missing words? Type in the chat if you can guess the missing word. Eye contact, yes, exactly. Well done, Nancy. What about the second one? Eye contact and what you're looking at now, that's the missing word. Some presence, no. Student presence, silent. No, good try, self, no. What are you looking at now? This presentation, what is No, it's a screen, so screen presence. In other words, screen presence is how you appear on the screen or how your students appear on the screen. What about the next one? Don't just be a TH, it's not teacher. Don't just be a TH, a talking. Yes, Vivian got it first. Don't just be a talking head, that's Harold. Yes, well done, Harold. Don't be just a talking head. So if you can vary how you are on a screen, it will always help. What about the next one? Be, you know what? I'm going to move on and tell you the answers rather than, than drag this out for you. So here are the answers. So eye contact and screen presence. Don't be just a talking head. Body language is very important. Use of voice is also very important as uh, as you're telling me minimizing distractions use of the camera being familiar with the technology and then finally troubleshooting let me look at each one of these in turn the first one is eye contact and screen presence how can you best establish eye contact with students when teaching remotely well um, by looking directly into the camera lens rather than the screen this, this doing this will mean students will feel like you're looking at them in the eyes. This is particularly important if you have an external camera. I've turned my camera off so you can't see me doing this, but you can try it um, on your own. If you look into the camera rather than at the screen, even if you're using a laptop and the camera is built into the top of the screen, it will make a difference and the student will feel as if you're looking them in the eyes. Um, and this will help improve your online presence. You also should be aware of how you're presenting yourself on the screen too. Make sure you're not showing half of your head or presenting your body at a weird angle. Take care to illuminate yourself so you're not uh, in the shadows or it's too dark. The best thing to do that is if you can face a window or point a light source at you rather than positioning it behind you, and this will help. Next, don't be just a talking head. If you want your online lesson to be memorable, then don't just present yourself as a talking head. I just show, you know, don't just show your head and shoulders when teaching. You can stand up and you can move occasionally when appropriate. Use the space you have in front of the camera. For instance, to show a close-up of your mouth 
when teaching pronunciation. If you're teaching more than one student, then make sure you give them plenty of time to speak and try building in pair and group work to your lesson if you can. Remember, just because you're teaching online doesn't mean you shouldn't give the students as much time to speak as you would if you were sitting in the same physical space. And yes, Martin, Lozano, we will be sharing this presentation afterwards. Body language. You can't move around the classroom as a remote teacher, but you can use body language in different ways. You can exaggerate gestures and face expressions. And you should do that or they'll be lost on students who are looking at small screens. You can also gesticulate, use mannerisms, posture, and your stance to convey confidence and shyness when, wanted, when needed. Gestures in particular should be confident and clear when you're teaching live on life with a camera. Students won't capture small or subtle gestures. Think about your posture, don't slump, and make sure you smile. A simple smile will tell your students you're happy to be there with them. Be natural, however, but a forced or constant smile will give quite the wrong impression indeed. Vary your facial expressions and you better capture your students' attention and they'll learn more. Next, use of voice. How you use your voice when teaching live online is very important. Your voice is a very valuable asset that will help you create a mood, atmosphere and transmit emotion. You may not be aware that how you speak and what your voice sounds like can have an impact on learning outcomes, but if your students feel the teacher's voice is patronising, too loud or monotonous, then they may respond negatively. On the other hand, if your voice is expressive and lively, then you will draw their attention and more likely your students will be engaged and motivated with what you have to say, which is what it's all about. So what aspects of your voice should you be concerned with in order to encourage students to participate and learn? Well, as I said before, bringing the volume, speaking softer or louder, depending on what you're doing, will help you control the class. And yes, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, and yeah, you, you would fall asleep if you speak too long, definitely. Changing the tone of your voice is the best way to convey, convey a mood or an emotion. And uh, how low or high the pitch of your voice is important as well. If you vary the pitch, then you'll see more interesting to your students. And then finally, varying the pace of your voice. When and how long you pause, and how quickly or how slowly you speak, will have a result on how into account. Not only to, when teaching online, when teaching face to face as well, but particularly when teaching online. In definitely in circumstances such as now where you can't really see me, you can only hear my voice and my slides. Next is minimizing distraction. Giving the students attention when teaching online can sometimes be a challenge. You can help this by minimizing the opportunity for distraction. For instance, making sure the background, if you're using a camera, what is behind you, on the screen isn't too busy. If it is too busy, the students will be trying to read the titles of the books on the shelves behind you, for example, or they're caught, rather than concentrating on what you have to say. Oh, there are lots of ways you can use your webcam that may not be obvious. When you use your camera, you can introduce realia, as I mentioned, with the camera. You can show real life objects to illustrate vocabulary, etc. Um, for this, it helps to have an external webcam. Uh, however, you can do it with an internal webcam as well if you move the objects up to your camera. Even with a fixed webcam, you can move your body backwards and forwards to simulate zooming in and out. 
And remember, you can also move yourself out of the view of the camera and show something else. A small portable whiteboard, for example, or puppets, particularly if you're teaching young learners online. And let me see if my video is now working, if the connection is good enough. No. Um, in the chat, if it's causing too much of a problem with the audio, and I'll turn it off again. Right. Be familiar with your technology that you're using. Don't use a platform that you're unfamiliar with. And Manuel Andres Garcia Ramos said, we don't have a platform. Well, I'll come on to that. Because I think we do need to have a platform or choose a platform that to be able to use. Uh, when you have chosen a platform, for example, WebEx or Zoom or Teams, then what you need to do is become familiar with it. You need to know how to adjust the settings. There's nothing worse than students, for students than uh, them hanging around while twiddling your thumbs, while they're waiting for a teacher to adjust the technology. And Alexander says, uh, he uses Google Meet, but it's hard to set a virtual screen. I think what you need to do, every platform has its pros and cons, its limitations. You need to decide on a platform that works well for you and your students, and then try to make the most of it and becoming familiar with it. You have, you have to avoid messing around and any unnecessary waiting by having all of your websites and links, your presentations, etc., open before the class, and then you just switch the windows. If you do need time to do something, then plan your lesson well so students are doing pair or group work um, while you're dealing with technology. Troubleshooting. Troubleshooting and the importance of a plan B. Um, it's very important. Because sooner or later, if you're a remote teacher, then you will face technical difficulties. When this happens, you should know how to fix the basic problems and also to have a plan B, have another plan available if you can't connect with the students online. Now, this will very much depend on the context of your teaching and your students and what the technical problem is. Could be anything from asking a student to check their microphone settings or starting their computer again, in other words, turning it off and on again, which seems to work wonders, to rescheduling the lesson if you find it impossible to carry out uh, the online lesson because of, for example, connectivity problems. Experience will obviously help you here, but it's helpful to have thought things through. So you appear calm and decisive if you need to. A useful tip is to always have an alternative platform or way of contacting the students available. Back channels that I mentioned before, if you have problems with one in particular. Sometimes changing the tool often does the trick. And Natalie, Natalie Bettencourt is asking about children who don't have internet access. I think that's a very important question. It's not something I'm going to talk about today because I'm focusing on giving advice to teachers and with students who do have internet access. But it is something that you do have to consider. If that is your context, then you need a whole different type of strategies to the ones I'm uh, suggesting today. And I'm sure in future webinars that will be dealt with. Now, let me turn to online guided learning or asynchronous teaching and learning. That is not at the same time, so not what we're doing here, but when you are not necessarily connected at the same time as the students. Now, I don't think you need to be present at the same time as these students for learning to take place. It's a good thing to have this live interactive uh, teaching and learning. It can be uh, a lot more friendly. However, I think a combination of the live classes and self-study activities for your students to do on their own 
or with some of their classmates, for example, before and after the remote classes is a very good idea. There are lots of ways you can organize this work. But the most efficient way is by using a learning management system. And I'm going to talk about uh, how you can get the most of doing that. Now, there are lots of platforms or learning management systems that you can use. And for many of you, you may already have one that has been chosen for you. If that isn't the case, and you have to choose one, then what I would do is not spend too much time on it. Choose one that is popular. And I have two examples for you. One of them is Ed Wardle, or one of them is Google Classroom. Um, and those are two that I, I like. And I'll be looking at Google Classroom just as an example. But don't worry if this is not the platform that you want to use or that you're using at the moment, because a lot of the features of any learning management system, they're the same. A lot of the features are the same. They have the same functions. But being able to interact with students, for example, uh, offline is vital. Having um, the ability to interact with your students on the platform instead of with email, um, which is generally personal and which is difficult to track, is, is a good thing. So in the LMS, it's very easy to track conversations if they're posted and they're specific to that class. Uh, normally, a lot of LMS have uh, a Facebook-like space where you can post notices, where students can comment, but the students can also post. And that's it's good to keep this space for notifications and for socializing, which we shouldn't forget is an important part of online learning, just as important as face-to-face -face learning. So another thing that you have available to you in uh, an LMS is a participants list. And here in Google Classroom, you can see that uh, there are three people with the role of teacher in this online course. And then there's a list of students. Uh, this section allows you to see individual students when, and also will tell you usually when they last accessed the platform. You can see what time students spent here. You can monitor if any students are not accessing your platform or not spending much or any time studying. And if they're not accessing as frequently as you want, then you can contact the students, send them individual or group messages, to give them advice or find out why that is the case. You can also see the students who are accessing uh, the platform a lot. Classwork. There'll be a section where, where you can post tasks for the students to do. In some LMSs, uh, it's separate which is the Google Classroom um, that I'm showing at the moment. You can organize your material here. You can split it into modules and tasks. You can also usually decide which of the material you have is visible at any one moment, and which is accessible or which is locked. You don't want the students to go back and do anything more with it, if that's the case. You can prepare students to work on the resources so they don't become overwhelmed. You can also see very quickly how many students have accessed particular materials. So I can see by looking at this one on the screen, for example, that students of this course have actually replied and handed in or done the work that I asked them to do out of 169 that have been assigned the task. Then I could actually send those who haven't uh, done the work a reminder to do it. Deadlines is always a good idea with this kind of work, as I'm sure you all know, you're more likely to get it. And then finally, there's a section usually um, on an LMS which allows you to look at uh, the assessment of students, it allows you to look at their progress and to track that. Now, in the classwork section in Google Classroom, you can set assignments, be the multiple choice tests or more preform tasks. And in this assessment section, you can see the results of individual students 
or of a group of students. You can see which students have handed in the, uh, the work, whether they've done it on time, whether they've done it late, or whether it's missing, for example. And you can very quickly results of a particular student. The LMS, if it's done automatically, if you have multiple choice questions, will usually calculate the correct answers. If you're asking for test, you can assign um, marks out of 10, for example, and then the LMS will calculate the overall score. So you can very easily see how students are progressing, which is why this is also another, which is also why this is a very valuable tool. Now, when it comes to writing grammar and vocabulary, the tools offered by an LMS are usually more than fine. And you can usually provide links and, um, and embed listening from outside sources, audio or video, for example. However, when it comes to speaking, you may want to use a different platform for practicing and or assessing speaking online. I have one I can recommend to you today. It's called Flipgrid. Flipgrid is free and it's an easy and great tool for getting students in your class to share audio or video with you and other students. You can use it for presentations, you can ask them to respond briefly to questions, to read out their compositions or text, etc. And you can set up a private or make it a public space. It's really up to you. It's a very flexible tool. Once you've set up um, a channel for your class, you can create different tasks. You can provide text or audio or video input or instructions um, on the page. Uh, as in the example here, which is a text instruction, but I can also add a, an audio. You can see a little blue speaker icon there for the audio. Vocaroo and Loom is being mentioned by Nikolai. And definitely, what I didn't want to do here was to, just to give you a lot of different tools. But there are lots of other um, tools out there which do a similar job. Loom is one, Vocaroo is another, very good for audio. Flipgrid is something that I particularly like. It's audio and video. It's very easy to use and very flexible. But there are others, which, as people are mentioning in the, um, in the chat box. And please do, Nikolai, for example, share links to those tools in case people are interested in following them up. So when it comes to using Flipgrid, you can record video directly using your webcam, or you can have the students record using uh, a their phone, for example, and then upload the previously recorded video, which might be more useful or better easier for them to do. And Flipgrid actually allows you and other students to comment on the video and also allows you to grade the video. So you can give written feedback to the person who records it. So it's ideal uh, for not only practicing speaking, but also for assessment purposes. And here is a Colombian educator, uh, Julian Montana, who very kindly responded to a task that I set for teachers during one of my courses. Thank you, Julian, if you're out there watching this live or arena the recording. Right, so I've actually given you so far um, today some ideas of how to respond to the school closures and get started very quickly both as a remote teacher and also with guided online learning using the platform. However, once you've started, I really recommend you try to find time to increase your knowledge and skills uh, of, of online learning and teaching. And here now are some ways that you can do this. First of all, there's so much now written about the experience of teaching online. I think it's always good to find the time to read articles or to look at some of the research or share experience with others. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a book chapter that I wrote for a book that was published by the Teacher Association, Aya Tethel's Learning Technologies Special Interest Group, the LTC. And I wrote this in uh, collaboration with the quality manager 
in Uruguay called Alicia Artusi. And Alicia and I wrote about our experience. We researched um, a group of remote teachers working in Uruguay um, about their experience of remote teaching, what they needed to know, what helped them when they were beginning, what they thought was uh, made a, a very good remote teacher, etc. Um, and we wrote about it in the book. And Alicia also used the observations that she did as a quality manager with teachers uh, to inform that chapter. So we did surveys, focus groups, and we took Alicia's observations and the observations of her quality manager to inform the uh, chapter. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the results that we found. I think it's very important to join a community of practice. Now, that means joining a group of peers, of people who are learning how best to do things. So it could be at your school, it could be in a wider community, it could be online. Um, there are a lot of communities of practice or teaching online if you want to find one. Um, I think this learning from each other and sharing your experience it's one of the best ways that you can develop as a teacher. Um, you can get tips and links to, um, to things that can be of use. You can share your experiences, your lesson plans, your resources. It would be particularly helpful, I think, for you as a group uh, in Colombia to actually uh, have a belong to a community of practice of other teachers doing the same thing as you. Um, and that way you will see a lot more benefit. Right, now on to some of the findings of this chapter that I wrote. Um, this book, by the way, is, uh, is available free to anybody who belongs to the technology SIG of IOTEFL. Otherwise, you have to pay for it. So what I'm going to do now is just to talk a little bit about some of the findings. You can have a look at these on the slides, which will be shared with you, I hope, afterwards. Um, but let me just draw my, your attention to a few of the things that we found. So a good remote teacher, um, some of these you will see um, are similar to a good face-to-face -face teacher, but then some of the things are specific to online learning. For example, a good remote teacher trains the students to use the learning management system so they become independent learners. That's very important. The students need to take more responsibility for their learning. It's not all about them sitting back and being taught. It's about them actually doing things and finding out things and learning for themselves as well. So I think that's the one to highlight there. On the second page, what I would say is that some of the things I've already mentioned about gesture, smile, or stand ups. I think using props, toys, posters, puppets, uh, the realia, I think it's a very important thing. All in all, what we found is that you need to make the online experience, just as you need to make the face-to-face -face experience, a memorable experience. Um, the students need to have something that they will uh, remember afterwards. So ways of varying the interaction, et cetera, will all help with that. Now, we're coming to the close of the webinar and very shortly I'll be able to take questions that you've been sending but before I do so I want to share with you uh, with those of you who don't know it the British Council's teaching English web page this has a lot of resources articles presentations tips and ideas for you in this new adventure of online learning and teaching that you've started and the website has also launched a series of webinars to help language teachers update their skills. So I know you've got 12 webinars coming up, which uh, have been planned for you, which is fabulous. That should be enough. But if it isn't, or if you want to look for something about very specific types of, of things that are not covered by the programme of webinars that the Ministry and the British Council have planned for you, then this is a good place to start. Uh, you can update your skills um, that way. There are also very short video presentations about remote teaching, uh, different aspects of it, including remote teaching when um, connectivity is, um, is low, which is something that's come up already in the chat. All of these resources are free and you can access them 
and there are specific primary, secondary, and adult levels, including lesson plans, activities, stories, poems, songs, and teaching tools. And there are also special resources, as I said, for educators coping with the impact of COVID-19 and the school closures. There's a lot on child protection. There's a lot on uh, equality um, and inclusion uh, on special education needs. So you should find something that you're looking for there. So a little bit earlier than anticipated, what I'm going to be doing now is winding up a little bit and hoping to take some of your questions, which my colleagues, um, I think, have been compiling. I'm going to take a little bit of a breather, and I think I'll hear what questions you've had. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, yes, indeed, we have been collecting many of your questions, and we have selected some of them. Uh, for that, I would like to introduce Carolina Cruz. She's the head of English from the British Council. We support in this first webinar. And at the end, I saw I know that you have been asking some questions about the ministry and the program them after the questions of uh, uh, that being proposed for Graham. Okay, Carolina, welcome. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Graham. I think it was enriching. Um, I hope it, it, it has helped everyone. Um, and well, uh, we collected lots and lots of questions, but uh, unfortunately, we cannot answer them, um, all of them at the same time, um, but we kind of put together uh, some of them. First, um, this one, um, I, I believe it is important to give like a, a kind of a, a definition to teachers. Some of them were asking about the difference between remote teaching and, on, uh, and online learning. Um, and they were also saying if it was a new way to call online learning. Well, um, I did I did mention that at the beginning of the presentation, but uh, apologies if my voice was breaking, breaking up yeah. or it wasn't clear. But I think for me, online Online learning, e-learning, there are lots of different terms which cover this. It's all about digital learning. It's about learning online, teaching online. Now, if we want to make a distinction between what we're doing at the moment, which is learning remotely or sharing remotely, this is remote teaching. In other words, if you're teaching students, live online so when students and the teacher are together in the same virtual space or platform as we are today that for me is remote teaching so it's using video conferencing or audio conferencing um, or even live interactive chat um, in the moment so synchronously that for me is remote teaching um, and generally for everyone else that is what the distinction is as well. Now, what the other type of teaching or learning, which is not at the same time or live online, is uh, technically it's called asynchronous. So teaching or learning asynchronously. Um, we try to call that the British Council. We call that guided online teaching. In other words, it, you don't have to be online with your students at the same time you could you know you might connect as a teacher at nine o'clock in the morning at 12 o'clock and at three o'clock and then six o'clock or whatever you do during the day to respond to students who have left messages for you in a learning management system or via email or some other way you're not connected at the same time as your students and that is very useful in particular, if you're in different time zones, or if you can't guarantee um, a synchronous connection at the same time. So that's the distinction, really. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, well, we had also many different questions coming from, from the Facebook um, live that we are having right now. And I know that you mentioned that uh, this session was focused on the part of online teaching. 
but um, since there were so many questions related to this part, um, people were wondering if you could give like suggestions or, or ideas on how teachers that do not have educational platforms um, or and, and have like faced this kind of, of a situation like the one that we did before through WhatsApp. Um, I don't know if, if you probably could share some ideas, suggestions, or probably refer to, to some other experts. Yeah, I mean, my speciality is, is this uh, teaching live online in particular, or, or supporting the students through a platform. Um, I think what you need to do is really, um, you need to try and find the solution for your particular teaching and learning context. So you need to find out if your students, if they're at home, if they have, have access to the internet, if their internet connection is good enough to do this type of live online work. If it is, then that's the preferred way, I think. I think being able to connect live online with your students with remote teaching um, is, is fabulous. Um, supported also by having access to a platform don't platform set up that's okay you yourself can just set up google classroom it's open as an individual or as a school or as a group of teachers you can just google classroom and set it one up and it's very very easy to do for example as is edmodo edmodo is another one that i shared earlier it's very easy for teachers just to set it up and it's free as well and that way you can connect with your students Usually you will need your students emails to be able to do that. The students need to have access to email or be able to set an email account up. For that you may need permission from parents. These are all things that you have to work through unfortunately, but there is any way of generalizing that. Each individual teacher or school um, has to actually be able to work out what is the way that they can do that. If you if you to connect with the internet, then that becomes more difficult. And I think there are other ways of doing it, which involve paper, but paper is very difficult to distribute. Uh, it takes time to be printed, etc. But it is possible, and you can do that. Telephones, as you said, WhatsApp. If you have a, you know, even if you have the ability to have a WhatsApp chat with your students, if you can do that. That allows you to do uh, learning. It's more limited, but it, it does allow you to do it. If you can get some access to materials somehow to the students, then and you establish even a text chat with them somehow, whether it's on a platform, through social media, through WhatsApp, then you can actually um, do quite a lot. I think today's session, I wasn't really able to go into all of the details. There's so many different ways of doing it, and each of them have their difficulties and you know their pros and cons. Um, if there was a large enough group of people who have to use, for example, WhatsApp or can't use any kind of internet access, then what I would suggest is that there's another uh, training session specifically for that. By someone who knows a lot more about it than I do, because I'm not particularly an expert in that. Thank you very much, Graham. We understand that. Um, also, we had like um, some other type of questions, um, as you were mentioning child protection, and some of the teachers um, attending this session were wondering about the right of um, privacy and child protection with regards to the use of camera. So they were asking, like, what would be like the most convenient way to encourage students to use their cameras? So first, to make sure that there is child protection uh, policies in place. And second, like not to feel speaking alone. Uh, some of them mentioned that it was like a kind of monologue. They're just talking on, on, on their cameras. So what kind of recommendations would you have here? Yeah, again, it's a complicated situation when you're video conferencing, I think you need buy-in from the parents and the students. So um, you need to have the students comfortable about connecting online 
and using camera or an audio um, and you need the parents for them to be uh, happy with that as well. Um, using cameras and going into people's homes brings all sorts of things up. You know, does the student have a, a space where they feel comfortable that they can actually preferably be on their own or with a parent or guardian who will at least just be in the background and not interrupt or disrupt the lesson is important. Um, the camera aspect of things really, um, I think you need protocols in place for the class. So the students need to know that they need to respect the privacy of the other students. Um, they shouldn't be sharing uh, what is goes on in the class in the same way that you know you wouldn't want students to use their cell phones and take photos of people in the class and then share them on social media as well. Does this happen? Yes. But I think as a teacher, what you need to do is early on have that discussion with students and make sure they know what they should not and should do. And have that discussion about respect um, with other students. What what is it re, you know privacy is very important for everybody and permission to share, for example, video or photos is something that nowadays we have to bring up with students anyway. We have to be aware as a teacher of the potential problems and also make sure that everybody's comfortable. And what you were saying about people speaking on their own, this is why I didn't have time today to go into it, but there's something called breakout rooms in video conferencing. And um, if you look for that, and I'll just type it in the chat, you can get a lot of help with them. Um, they're usually specific to the platform that you use, which is one of the reasons why I didn't want to, to do it today. But using a breakout room, you can send students in pairs or in small groups to, to different virtual rooms, and you, the teacher, can then go and visit them. And what that means is that there's less less sort of pressure of them speaking um, online to a group, uh, to the whole class, etc. So as Edward says, in Zoom you can use it, you can also use it in Teams, um, although it's a little bit more difficult. Um, I'm not sure if WebEx allows you to do that, I think it does. Um, I think most platforms that are used for training and teaching allow you to do it. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, Carlos, do we still have time for another question? Yes, maybe two, and then okay. we can. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Well, uh, we tried to group the questions uh, through kind of specific topics, and the next one, next one um, teachers were wondering about assessment through online or offline environments, because as, as, as you know, I mean, every teacher um, in the world and here in Colombia are struggling with that part. So we are trying to deliver sessions, but sometimes when we are to, to start the, the assessment part, we kind of hit the walls. Sure. I think, Carolina, that you'll be covering this in more detail with the, the app and specific to Colombia in future webinars, one, but I can generally online. So um, speaking assessment um, can actually be easier um, online if, for example, you get the student to prepare a presentation beforehand, to deliver it online, that's one way of doing things. You could get students to prepare videos and upload videos of the speaking assessment, as I mentioned before, using Flipgrid. Um, that kind of assessment is very easy. Using an LMS, you can actually create multiple choice um, quizzes uh, and stuff. And there are other tools as well that I'm sure some of you know um, that, that, that you can do, you can use to do that. So that's quite easy. Um, I think the kind of assessment where if you're talking about assessment, which is more formal, i.e. doing exams, 
I wouldn't connect with someone online to do that unless you really want to. I wouldn't connect with your students and have them do an exam while sitting there, sort of waiting to them, invigilating online. Um, there isn't really any reason for that that I see personally. I think if you can send them tests to do on their own, and you might say, well, what about copying the subject? Well, that is, a, that is an issue, but what you can do is if you design a test so that the questions are slightly different to each of the students, so a bit more work, but that will avoid, and they're in different orders, that will avoid the kind of copying and reduce the amount of um, risk of that. So all sorts of things. There is a very good Facebook live chat recording on the Teaching English website. If you go to the, if you search on in Google for Teaching English British Council Remote Teaching Assessment, you should find a recording that was half an hour where there was a discussion uh, that people had about assessing students online. And I recommend that as a follow up. Great, thank you very much, Graham. And as you mentioned, and probably Carlos will, will um, dig deeper into that part later, but there are a couple of webinars coming uh, soon with regards to formative assessment, the use of the app, and the way that teachers could start um, yeah, using formative assessment through online or remote uh, teaching. Um, that are, that are, I should attend those. I will invite you. <laughs> Great. Um, there are two very specific questions that, that have um, arrived as well. And one has to do with uh, some references or books that you could recommend to, to like go deeper into online teaching and learning. And the other part um, has to do with suggestions or recommendations on how to become part um, of of um, of an online group, um, uh, that 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 you were talking uh, before about like the communities of practice, so like where teachers can become part of them. Sure. So for the first one, there are lots of these. What I'm going to do is I'm going into the chat now a link to. Um, the British Council, actually, that is not what I wanted to do. I've just put in a link to the British Council of America's page. Um, what I was looking for, and I'll, I'll try and find it now, is the British Council Teaching English page uh, has uh, a lot of links to things that you can read. Um, Hopefully, this is the um, this is it. If not, then if you look at it, there's a lot to 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 explore on the British Council Teaching English website um, with links to articles, etc. I'm just putting in a few links, but there are a lot more. Um, I'm not going to be able to find the right ones that I want, but I think you need to explore the Teaching English website, and there, that will give you lots of different uh, things to read um, related to remote teaching. Yeah, thank you, Graham. Um, Only what we could do, sorry to interrupt, is include the list on the presentation, and then we could share that. Perfect. And we will arrange for that as well. And then the second part of your question, could you repeat that again, Carolina? Yeah, like uh, teachers were wondering how they could be part of a community of practice. Right, communities of practice. Well, what, what I think would be most useful for teachers in Colombia who are all in the same boat is to start together forming communities of practice. So whether that is with a group of um, a group of you who work in the same school, the same area, or you know the same type of teaching, you know primary, secondary, whatever. Um, then connect with other other teachers 
in that way um you can do it via whatsapp you can do it via facebook you can do it via the google classroom or edmodo or other ways of doing it so that would be i think one of the best ways of you joining or forming a community practice that would be very relevant to your own context um other communities of practice that are interesting if there are any teacher educators out there for example the british council has a teacher educator community of practice teaching english the website you can join that and that allows you to share your experience with other teachers globally so there's another example of community of practice and there's a lot of that happening at the moment on facebook there are groups of teachers by type uh, with a you know with a remote teaching community of practice there are um, i'm sure various groups columbia and then also teaching associations i'm a big fan as you might have gathered i'm a member of the teaching association an active member uh, of IATEFL, and i do recommend that that is one of the best ways of connecting with your peers with other teachers and they usually have already set up ways forums community of practice on special interests for example so those are some ideas for you okay thank you very much graham i think i mean there were so many questions uh i wish we could have had have had the time for all of them um but but we couldn't i still will like put them all together and send them to you and see if we can find a way to to answer them all yeah if you if you compile them and send them to me i'll i'll do my best to to um to answer them in a in a fact or something or a question i'm, I'm yeah. always interested in knowing in in understanding what teachers want to know and what they don't know so that would be very useful great thank you very much graham a pleasure Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Graham. I think it's been really good for teachers to get some tips on how to approach remote teaching. Uh, I've been receiving some questions about the program. Uh, of course, we are going to be developing more webinars like this about other subjects. Uh, I see some of you are really stressed about the fact that some students are not connected to the Internet and some webinars are going to be addressing this issue. So make sure you follow us on Facebook and on Twitter to make sure that you get uh, the latest news about the webinars, the dates and the times that we're going to be doing those. Um, again, thank you very much to the British Council, Carolina, Graham, it's really, it's been really good. Thank you to, to all the 2000 teachers that were connected to this webinar, 1200 on this WebEx platform and 800 on the Facebook Live. This webinar is going to be, I'm going to be sharing to you my screen uh, to show you where it's going to be. Uh, you can go directly to contactomaestro.colombiaprende.edu.co uh, in my screen is uh, I'm, being, I'm showing this on my screen you can go to the transformar area area where are the webinars and uh, oops something else didn't work i'm gonna refresh it and información go to formación and there are some webinars available online and we are basically every day we are posting it every day a new webinar that is available not only for english language teachers but also for all kinds of teachers so make sure that you follow us on this web page that is called contactomaestro.colombiaprende.edu.co we will be posting the video of this webinar uh, and also the ppt with all the links that been that have been shared by by graham so thank you very much for being in this webinar. Uh, see you soon and good luck with everything. Gracias. Hasta luego. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone.